One of the central thrusts of the Prime Minister's Independence Day speech was his promise that India will be the world's third largest economy before the end of what he claims will be his third term in power. And the person who has to lead India's charge when it comes to economic growth is uh, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman, who now joins us uh, on this uh, special Independence Day broadcast. Nirmala ji, welcome to the India Today group and wish you a very, very happy Independence Day. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to start by asking you about the Prime Minister's promise to make India the third largest economy in the next five years. You're the person who's literally driving the economic engine of this country. We're seeing some forecasts which suggest that India could potentially be the third largest economy by the year 2027. There are others who are a little cautious and think that this may more likely happen by 2030. As the finance minister of this country, how confident are you that by the year 2027, as the SBI's economic rap suggests, uh, that India will indeed be the world's third largest economy? Let's start from there, madam. Well, I'm confident because there are enough steps being taken and more will be taken as we go along to sustain the momentum of our growth and it is because of that confidence we are able to say yes that we will reach uh, India as a, de a developed country by 2047. Now third largest it is certainly something which PM has mentioned as a guarantee that in his third term we will achieve it because it requires unlike the way in which some of the Congress senior leaders are commenting anyway it will happen by default no, nothing happens for your, by default. You will have to put effort to achieve certain targets. Otherwise, I India had the potential at the end of 2004 to be a better economy, a larger economy even then. But in spite of all the benefit of Atal Bihari Vajpayee government, which the UPA enjoyed during its first five years, we ended up being a fragile five country. So. It is not by default that countries go down the drain or reach certain rank. Uh, it is definitely with a lot of efforts. Now, for reaching Fragile 5, five was definitely with effort because the attention out. was in corruption. Attention was doing... Sorry? Your critics will point out, ma'am, that lofty economic promises have been made by this government in the past as well. The government said by 2022, India would be a $5 trillion economy. In 2023, India is only a $3.7 trillion economy. We have about $1.3 trillion to go before we get to uh, the $5 trillion mark. And of course, we had the pandemic in the middle, which was the kind of black swan event that nobody had anticipated. But uh, questions would be asked about the certainty with which this promise is being made, given that there are quite a few unknown variables which could still slow down India's growth over the next five years. Uh, uh, while I agree with you, Rahul, black swan events take away a lot of uh, you know, the good work one has done, laid the foundation, but all that goes for nothing when there is an unpredictable huge hit. But keeping in mind the fact that in spite of the lockdown and uh, the hitting uh, or the hit that the Indian economy took, we have now recovered and the path to the recovery is very clearly sustainable. In fact, we are one of the fastest growing economies. So take that as an example. Black Swan events cannot be predicted, I agree. But if you have a determined leadership, stable and transparent policy, no pilferage, no way in which middlemen are given any role to play, people understand that what they work for they get as reward and there is nobody else claiming undue advantage in between. There is hope and there is also a possibility that the trust globally because of a stable leadership and definitive policies we can move fast
Now, I was reading some of the economic debate around the third fastest, the world's fastest growing big economy and the third largest economy in the world. And one of the things that's being said in a lot of the economic commentary, and I'm sure you've read this, is that while India is highly likely to overtake Germany, which at uh, 2022 constant prices stood at 3.62 trillion dollars, uh, the prospects of overtaking Japan are not quite as certain given that Japan is seeing a bit of a bounce back in its own economic growth. If Germany grows at about 2 percent between 2022 to 29 and India grows at an average of 5.1 percent, beating Germany is quite certain but beating Japan is trickier. So I most certainly don't think that there is any arithmetic inevitability, inevitability involved at what you're trying to achieve. No, uh, whilst I wish Germany and Japan do well because they are economies which have played pivotal role in development and led the development, global development and so on, it is a fact, particularly in Japan, that their population is aging. They are now reaching a stage where the uh, youth population, the productive population, is not proportionately higher than the aging population. As a result, the, there is quite a concern about Japan sustaining its growth. Let's not forget, contrary to that, India's uh, youth population, the productive age population, is growing and also because of skills and access to good education, they're coming out as people who are enter enterprising enough to find some outlet to put their energies to constructive use. Ma'am, let's take a look at some of the criticism coming from the opposition uh, on the government's claim that India will be the third largest economy in the next five years. P. Chidambaram, uh, your predecessor in the finance ministry, says India's per capita income right now is 128. Uh, while we will become the third largest, they're saying, look at prosperity, look at per capita income, which is far more important than just looking at the size of the economy, which also has to do with uh, the sheer number of people in India. UK uh, per capita income was $47,232. India's per capita income is only $2,085. So a big disparity when it comes to wealth per person. Of course, because our population is so big, there's no doubt. And only by growing uh, the GDP wider will there be more resources. And it is very important for us to take it further that way, to make sure that we are able to expand our GDP. The pie should become larger so that more people can get more share. That is stating the obvious. That is absolutely stating the obvious. But coming from somebody who advised us during COVID, to print money, to print money and distribute. And for those countries which went in that kind of a route, being advised by their own people, you see the state of affairs in those economies. So I take all the comments, I take the advice, but I'll put it in the Indian context and take us further with a greater sense of, you know, we need to serve the nation, we need to serve the people, and we have to be responsible about it. The next few weeks are very important for uh, the Modi government because this is when India hosts the big G20 summit. And next weekend is when India will be hosting the B20, the Business 20 uh, summit. A lot of top corporate leaders coming in. Do you want to give our viewers a sense of the preparations and from your perspective as Finance Minister Nirmala Ji, the key takeaways you're hoping to achieve at a time when a whole galaxy of top corporate uh, icons and titans from the world will be descending on New Delhi. What do you hope to achieve during that big weekend? Well, I think the business community are messengers of the health of the economy. They are the people who truly, from their own circles, assess how economies are today. They've always done it and now all the more. The visit of very many big uh, business leaders during the next weekend, I see is a time when they will get a true picture of what India is. 
and therefore they will carry the message about how ready India is post the COVID to be able to become the engine of growth for the world and also see the talent of our youngsters, the potential that India offers. And I think it's very critical that it happens and happens close to the summit itself, which is happening in September. One of the concerns, Madam, at this moment is surging inflation. Uh, the July numbers for consumer price inflation show food inflation at 11.51, CPI at 7.44. As Finance Minister, how concerned are you by rising inflation? And what do you want to tell our viewers about your plan to try and ensure the things that the common man, our viewer, consumes on a daily basis are as reasonably priced as is possible. We've seen in the cases, for example, of tomatoes, where there's been runaway inflation, which the government's been trying, but so far not fully succeeding in reining in. Well, uh, crops like tomatoes, which are perishable and which are also very susceptible to flooding and draining of water and uh, you know, storage related issues and so on will give a big challenge to us and that's what we are facing in the last few weeks. I said it in the parliament when I spoke recently that we are taking efforts to procure tomatoes from tomato growing regions and bring them to Delhi and other places and have them distributed in every nook and corner of the city. Similarly, we are importing from Nepal to be able to distribute it to states such as Uttar Pradesh, Bihar and Uttarakhand. They've already commenced. So we shall keep this effort going and that will also be the case for uh, onions, for instance, because if parts of onion growing territories like Lasalgaon and Nashik area suffer for some reason or the other, we are going to then have to do some things to ensure enough supply reaches the market. We will continue to do our efforts on this. Ma'am, in his Independence Day speech, the Prime Minister spoke a lot of Yuva Shakti, uh, an era where the world is driven by technology. And one of the big concerns is the rapid spread of artificial intelligence and how AI potentially could disrupt the job market of the present and the future and how you as finance minister are hoping to equip Indian youth and citizens with the skills to be able to ensure, given the state of higher education in India, that when they come out, or even if they're employed, they're able to equip themselves with the skills required to be able to survive and thrive in the age of AI. Well, I think in the budget itself, we made an announcement for India to become an AI hub. And for that, we are creating three centers of excellence in uh, three uh, eminent institutions of the country. Uh, furthermore, we are working closely with also the industry to see where uh, bringing in AI would increase productivity because the productivity gains which can come out of AI are there for the industry just to utilize. And unless they take steps towards that, productivity gains will be a loss for us and it will be a, a big uh, industry will lose out big if they don't uh, achieve productivity gains. But the disruption in the job market is being addressed because youth are being trained in handling uh, coding, in handling uh, various tools that you can generate out of AI. The efforts are on, on this. One of the things the Prime Minister spoke about was border security, India's uh, security in the global uh, scenario. And one of the things the government has tried to do on the economic front is try and untangle from China to create, uh, I don't want to say restrictions, but to make it tougher than it was in the past for Chinese companies to come and take over the Indian market. What we've seen though, ma'am, if you look at data for the last couple of years, India's Trade deficit with China is actually increasing. Our imports are increasing at a far higher rate. Our exports are actually coming down. So how do you look at this unfair Himalayan exchange? And what are you hoping to do to try and ensure that the trade deficit with China doesn't keep running away in the way that it is right now? 
uh, see, it is, uh, I think it is important to understand the trade with China. Market access is never given to India. Very little access. And even if they say, no, the access is available, they come up with non-tariff -ta barriers to divert uh, the source from where they would buy. They wouldn't give access because they've raised, the ta uh, they've raised other standards. They would come up with phy phytosanitary standards and uh, stop your goods from coming into India. China has not been treating Indian goods both for market access purpose and also for the purposes of value chain links fairly. This is, a, some, uh, this is a thing which the Commerce Ministry keeps literally raising it in every meeting with the Chinese. That is one thing. Second, equally, for many of our small and medium manufacturers, affordable raw material and affordable intermediary goods which come in for making something else and then exporting it is a very critical uh, component. If for India's own manufacturers, if, for instance, in some cases like steel and so on, if the raw material is not available for in an affordable rate, the, there is a tendency in our MSMEs, and nothing wrong with that, to say, if this is not cheaper for me, I will import it. Now, by reducing the import or stopping that import because it comes from somewhere where it is affordable for our Indian MSMEs to buy, you're going to curb the MSMEs growth. So there is a dilemma. We'll have to handle it carefully. One more last question before I let you go. Uh, Mr. Taraman, I don't want to keep you on Independence Day for too long. Uh, the export numbers which came out for the month of July showed export declining 16% to $32.25 billion. Imports also came down because of global headwinds. Indian exports are now contracting for the sixth straight month. How concerned are you? Do you see this as short term or because of the fact that there are serious global headwinds? Uh, do you see this as being a mid medium term problem? And how are you hoping to deal with this map? Well, yes, the, the global unstable uh, demand, uh, unstable situation globally, all that leads to fluctuation in export and import. We'll have to be constantly monitoring it and try to help with uh, the exporters, give them some kind of a support, hand-holding and so on. So these are very dynamic, particularly post the war where, uh, you know, the export markets are suffering for want of demand and the import for our people is also su uh, suffering because of the exchange rate fluctuations as well. So we'll have to keep monitoring it and see where we can help our people. And lastly, ma'am, of all the things you've done as finance minister, what is the one thing on Independence Day that you look back with greatest pride at? And what's the one thing that you wish you'd, you'd been able to fix but so far haven't? Uh, well, there are quite a few things that I can say, but at this moment, I think I'll leave it there and uh, only ensure that we'll work far more for the inflation-related issues. Okay, we would leave it over there. Nirmala Sitaramanji, thank you very much for joining us on Independence Day. Thank you. We wish thank you all the very best. Thank you, ma'am.